Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth Cassidy, Director of Research and Policy at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF. For those not familiar, USERF is an independent, bipartisan government body created over 20 years ago by the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. Our mandate is to monitor conditions for freedom of religion or belief abroad and make policy recommendations to the President, Secretary of State, and Congress. Today's event corresponds with the launch of USERF's new report on religious freedom violations in North Korea. I'm joined today by two of our commissioners, Commissioner Fred Davey and Commissioner Jim Carr. We also are joined by three expert panelists from Korea Future, co-director Su Young Yu, investigator Inja Huang, and chief strategy officer James Burt. We will begin with opening remarks from Commissioner Davey and Commissioner Carr, and then we will hear from Su Young, Inja, and James, the three primary authors of the report we are releasing today. Afterwards, I will moderate a brief conversation among the speakers with some opening questions. Following that, there will be time for questions uh, from the audience uh, for our speakers. To ask a question, please use the Zoom webinar function Q&A at the bottom middle of your screen. You can submit your question in writing at any point during the event starting now. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Commissioner Davey. Thank you, Elizabeth. And welcome to my fellow, fellow panelists and everyone who tuned in to join us today. The North Korean government is widely known as one of the worst religious freedom violators in the world. USERF has consistently recommended North Korea be designated as a country of particular concern or CPC for many years. And the State Department has, repeat, has repeatedly made that designation. The non-governmental organization Open Doors has long ranked North Korea at the top of its world watch list as the countries where Christians face the most extreme persecution. Indeed, religious freedom is non-existent in North Korea and religious adherents face severe persecution for practicing and holding their faiths and beliefs. Despite North Korea's notoriously bad religious freedom record, religious freedom conditions inside the country remain poorly understood and underreported. Information is difficult to obtain due to North Korea's closed and isolated nature. The report we are releasing today titled Organized Persecution, Documenting Religious Freedom Violations in North Korea will provide significant advances and updates in our understanding of religious conditions in North Korea. I hope this valuable information will inform the US government and more broadly, the international community on the systematic, ongoing, and egregious nature of the North Korean government's religious freedom abuses. I hope that it will help facilitate efforts to hold the North Korean government accountable and help advance for victims of these horrific religious um, and help advance justice for victims of these horrific religious freedom violations. I now turn the floor over to Commissioner Jim Carr for his remarks. Commissioner Carr. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to my friend, Commissioner Davey. Also want to thank James, Sue Young, and Inja for joining us today to discuss this new report, which you three have worked so diligently on for many months. The report is based on primary information gathered over the past year from in-person interviews with North Korean defectors who have firsthand knowledge about religious freedom violations in North Korea. It's a comprehensive report that covers the systematic, ongoing and egregious nature of the North Korean government's violation of religious freedom in that country. It assesses the overall organizational structure of religious freedom violations in North Korea and the report documents how the North Korean Workers' Party and government institutions enforce these violations through multiple state agencies, particularly the infamous Ministry of State Security, MSS, and the Ministry of People Security, MPS. It also recounts specific forms of violation, torture, and mistreatment 
experienced by religious adherents. The report finds that the North Korean government exerts absolute control over religion and denies the North Korean people freedom of religion from birth. The government severely punishes any forms of deviation from its official ideology and policy with Christians and adherents of shamanism particularly targeted for the persecution. The level of restrictions placed on religious freedom and the severity of government abuses as detailed in this report are deeply disturbing. I encourage all who are concerned about religious freedom and human rights conditions in North Korea to read this report. I will now turn it over to Su Young to give a more in-depth overview. Su Young. Well, thank you, Commissioners Davy and Carr, and thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it is an honor to speak at today's event, and we thank you, sir, for its vital leadership in the defense of international religious freedom, and also for hosting this really important conversation on religious freedom, but religious freedom in North Korea. I will talk about the context in which crimes against religious communities are taking place in North Korea, the nature of these crimes, and the organizations that are responsible for these crimes. The report tells us that as recently as 2019, shamanic and Christian adherents were being subjected to violations that may amount to crimes against humanity, namely arbitrary deprivation of liberty, torture and cruel inhumane or degrading treatment, persecution and the deprivation of life, and other serious crimes such as the violation of religious freedom from birth. The report tells us about the state organizations who carried out these crimes, including Ministry of People Security, MPS, the Ministry of State Security, MSS, and the organizations who are ultimately responsible for the policies, leadership, and the wider environment that enabled these crimes. The report tells us why religious persecution is happening and how the destruction of religious community is fundamental to the defense of an ideology that exists only to sustain Kim Jong-un and the North Korean leadership. But ultimately, this report provides evidence that can lead to justice, accountability, and the protection of religious communities in North Korea. Because of time constraints, I won't go into the recent history of religious persecution in North Korea, but it is important to say that until the late 1940s, there were thriving religious communities in the country. But today, only fragments of two religious communities remain. And in the place of religious freedom is a document known as the Ten Principles. This is not simply an empty ideological manuscript. The Ten Principles define the standards of loyalty, deification, and unconditional obedience to the supreme leader. And it overrides constitution and criminal code, and it dictates all government policy. It is a rationale for all state persecution, including the Songbun system, which classifies North Korean citizens according to their perceived loyalty to the regime and the infamous political prison camp system. And it is the reason why religious communities are being persecuted. As a report documents, the 10 principles became real in two important ways. First, through the physical persecution of religious adherents, and second, through the total denial of knowledge of religious freedom to all citizens from the cradle to the grave. And this brings us to the question of who is being persecuted and by whom. The evidence in the report is based on 68 separate cases of North Korean state persecuting North Korean citizens for their religion or belief or for their association with religious persons. Shamanic adherents accounted for 63% of cases. 35% cases were related to Christianity and one case was related to Chondogyo. There are greater numbers of shamanic adherents in North Korean society, and consequently, there are higher numbers of arrests and violations compared to the smaller Christian community. However, crimes committed against Christian adherents were more extreme and more violent than those perpetrated against shamanic adherents. And I do not have the time today to fully explain the organizational and common structures of the government that are responsible for the persecution of religious communities. But in short, we should see Kim Jong-un, the supreme leader, at the top of North Korea's chain of command. Below him is the organization and guidance department, which holds 
unchallengeable powers of command and control over all domestic and foreign policies, government institutions, military personnel, and party members in Pyongyang and in every province, city, county, town, and village. In this chain of command, the organization and guidance department exerts direct control over the two government institutions that oversee religious freedom violations. The Minister of State Security, which is North Korea's secret police and is primarily responsible for the persecution of Christians, and the Ministry of People's Security, which is a regular police force and is primarily responsible for the persecution of shamanic adherents. The report documents numerous crimes committed by officials from both of these organizations that may amount to crimes against humanity. At the most egregious end of the scale, there are credible accounts of the execution of Christian adherents who practice within the territory of North Korea rather than in or through China. And it is noteworthy that evidence about these incidents was obtained from former security officials reflecting the level of secrecy with which the state deals with incidents of Christianity that arise domestically. In one instance, six people convicted of practicing Christianity were executed in secret by firing squad in 2015 in the southern part of North Korea, with up to 40 others sentenced to a political prison camp for life. The execution marked the culmination of a case that was investigated over several years using infiltrator agents led by Ministry of State Security Central Command with joint operational control by the directors and political directors of province level and county level MSS. Cases of torture and other cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment were frequently documented and were perpetrated by North Korean pretrial investigation officers and correctional officers. This included physical beating, hanging torture, and exposure to extreme violence inflicted upon fellow prisoners. And alongside these physical violations, the inalienable right to adopt, change, or renounce a religion and to receive information and learn about religion and belief is denied in North Korea. At schools, young children are taught that Christian missionaries are spies of the countries who seek opportunities to invade North Korea. And they are shown graphic images of missionaries sucking the blood of children to show how malicious they are. And they are taken to state-run exhibition halls where religious adherents are presented as murderers, spies, and where Bibles are displayed as trophies taken from enemies of the state. This propaganda continues through high school, higher education, the workplace, and neighborhood residents or units, with each Saturday being devoted to learning Kim's teachings and confessing one's shortcomings according to the Ten Principles. And anyone suspected of being sympathetic to or practicing religion is reported through the party committee system. And even a suspicion that a person is associated with Christianity is sufficient for the Ministry of State Security to visit the person's residence for a door-to-door -door search. And if any signs of religious activity are to be found, the person and even their family can be forcibly detained. If they are unable to prove their innocence, they do not return home they are executed or sent to a political prison camp for the remainder of their lives. This uh, is the extent of the systematic and structured denial of religious freedom in North Korea. It is a system that relies on fear of the state rather than of faith and Kim. And while this may seem like a huge challenge for those in the international community who seek to protect the right to thought, conscience, religion, or belief, it is not. The evidence that is documented in the report tells us who did what, to whom, and why. This evidence means that justice is possible as long as there is sufficient political will to make it happen. Thank you for listening, and my colleague Inje will take over the presentation and talk about specific accounts of religious freedom violations in detail. Thank you very much, Su Young, for that compelling discussion of, of the um, findings in this report. Inja, now I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I would also like to thank you, sir, for providing the space to talk about religious freedom and North Korea. As the project investigator who directly worked with the interviewees for this report, I would like to add to the already insightful and enlightening speech of my colleague, 
by providing a brief summary of the status quo of religious freedom violations in North Korea based on recent defectors' witness accounts collected through September 2020 to March 2021. As stated earlier, a practice or manifestation of religious beliefs is a punishable offense in North Korea. It is also worth noting that the oppression of religious freedom is but one of human rights violations a North Korean individual accused of religious practice experiences during their involvement with the North Korean judiciary system. When questioned about the state of religious oppression in North Korea, most interviewees uh, recounted their personal experiences regarding systematic criminalization of Christianity and shamanism. Naturally, these two religious traditions are the most frequently cited religion-related causes for abuses within the North Korean criminal justice system. Witness and victim testimonies indicate that law enforcement officials of both MSS and MPS do not practice due process in accordance with international law in the investigation of religious practices. Arresting and detaining individuals suspected of the offense without necessary warrants, notification of rights, or the provision of legal assistance. Such a casual disregard for suspects' rights is but a minor part of a systematic pattern of human rights violations within the North Korean law enforcement system's treatment of religious practitioners. As one interviewee quoted, the suspects are seen as lesser than beasts. Within North Korean pretrial detention facilities, torture, including corporate punishments, physical beatings, body cavity searches, and positional torture are just some of the methods used both as a tools of intimidation for in extracting involuntary confessions and a method for maintaining inmate disciplines. I documented multiple accounts of interviewees experiencing or witnessing acts that are forbidden under the Convention Against Torture at the hands of correctional officers and interrogators in both MSS and MPS facilities, some of which are cited in the report. Even in the court of law, religious adherents are denied access to objective attorney representation and an impartial tribunal capable of the presumption of innocence. Defense attorneys belong to the Central Defense Attorney League, which is an organizational unit of the Workers' Party of Korea, and a defense attorney's duty to political reporting means that there can be no exception, expectation of anything like client attorney confidentiality. Oftentimes, defense attorneys relay victim testimonials to the very abusers, providing excuses for further violations within penal facilities. In other words, criminalization of religion in North Korea serves as another method through which the North Korean state can inflict upon its citizens the full range of systematic human rights abuses of its criminal justice system. In certain cases, individuals who try to manifest their faith within the penal facilities have received severe beatings by correctional officers who caught them in the middle of prayers or divinations. I recall one Christian victim who was beaten to the uh, brink of death, where the uh, correctional officers left the victim bleeding on the cell floor in front of other prisoners. Individuals who were found in possession of the religious items, such as Bibles or divination literature, were subjected to further sanctions by the hands of law enforcement officers. One victim who was arrested for the possession of a Bible was detained in a solitary confinement, starved and beaten with a metal rod used for cleaning rifles. As Suyun explained, all North Koreans, regardless of their rank or status, receive a lifetime of systematic anti-religion indoctrination through both mandatory education and also enforced ideological propaganda lectures provided by government officials from both judiciary and administrative branches of the state. One former uh, correctional officer who escaped in the last couple of years told me, we constantly received the Workers' Party of Korea directives prohibiting the practice of superstitious activities from above. They sent those down as the orders and their guidelines of Kim Jong-un. We got many of those in 2018 and 2019, about once a month. Among various religious traditions addressed in such indoctrination efforts, Christianity receives the most negative attention due to its connection with Euro-American cultures 
and its emphasis on the proselytization efforts. North Korean propaganda frequently portrays Christianity as a sham religion that facilitates sabotage and espionage efforts of the enemy. Its practitioners, active enemy sympathizers, and its clergy, no other than the hated Americans. Such negative propaganda against Christianity leads to the naturalization of severe persecution against these practitioners within the North Korean criminal justice system. Whereas the individuals charged with shamanism or chandogyo practice, uh, face uh, prison sentences or forced labor, those charged with Christianity often face summary executions or are forced to live out the rest of their lives inside political prisoner camps. Since Kim Jong-un came to power in 2011, there have been increasing crackdowns on shamanic adherence and harsher sentencing. Although engaging in shamanic practices carried the sentence up to three years, even before this time, public officials had typically turned a blind eye to aspects of the religious practice. This is no longer the case. Two periods of particular note were in 2013 to 2014, and recently again starting in January 2018. We gathered evidence that these crackdowns began immediately after directives authorized by Kim Jong-un on January 29th, 2018, and were distributed to local party committees and the MPS officers. We separately obtained documents that show central party committee directing various state entities to implement Kim Jong-un's directives on eradicating religious and superstitious practices in 2020. When guidance documents state that the directive was issued because officials failed to properly root out the criminal behavior, in this case, shamanic practices, they must now do all they can do to, show, to be shown to eradicate the problem. One public official who I interviewed had been involved in the arbitrary arrest and the detention of an elderly shaman. She was to be let off with a warning owing to her old age, but he told me, and I quote, when Kim Jong-un sent down directives calling for the punishment of all shamanic practitioners, the elderly fortune teller was punished and sent to a re-education camp. In conclusion, the mess of evidence documented from interviews with victims and witnesses of religious freedom violations in North Korea, in addition to interviews with perpetrators and documents sourced from state organizations active in the persecution of religious communities, leads to the realization of two insights. First, the practice of religion itself is treated as a criminal offense, and anyone affiliated with religions face the danger of exposure to a litany of human rights violations that permeates the North Korean judicial process. Second, the reason behind the North Korean regime's criminalization of religion lies in its awareness against the disruptive influences religions may impose on a caste system based on the adherence to the 10 principles. Because of this reason, Christianity, as an organized religion with a widely recognized Euro-American affiliation, retains the status of the most persecuted religion in North Korea. Thank you for your attention, and I will now yield the floor to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Injay, and all of you for bringing, bringing to light those stories of the, uh, of the horrific abuses that religious believers are ex experiencing in, in North Korea, which are, which are so hard to uh, obtain. Um, so we really, we really appreciate that. Um, next, I'll turn the floor over to James, who will speak about um, accountability options for these, these documented religious freedom abuses. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to echo my colleagues and extend my thanks to Yusuf for providing this really important opportunity to talk about religious freedom in North Korea. The nexus of, of persecution that's already been discussed by Suyan and NJ, which is namely the commission of the systematic physical violence and a methodical and planned denial of religious freedom poses a very serious challenge to international justice and the universal realization of the right to freedom of thought, conscience, uh, religion or belief. This report marks one of the first occasions where crime-based evidence of religious freedom violations has been linked through evidentiary materials to the policies that demonstrate intent and also to the political structures and chains of command that were responsible for coordinating or otherwise directing these crimes. What I'll briefly cover in my allotted time is the viability of accountability options and the prospects for justice for victims who have suffered the most egregious crimes based solely on their religious beliefs. 
we cannot and should not forget that North Korea is a country where international law has been violated on a very grand scale. Its people have witnessed and been subjected to systematic violence and abuse for seven decades, including unrelenting assaults on their faith. With this as the backdrop, the pursuit of accountability is unquestionably a good thing. Uh, on the one hand, it tells our adversaries about the values in which we fundamentally believe, namely respect for all human life and human dignity, and it starts to cement the legal and moral building blocks that will one day lead to justice. Accountability is, in this respect, as much about the process as it is about the end goal. It's not necessarily about targeting North Korea, it's about upholding international law at every point, uh, regardless of the state in question, and about uh, protecting the rights of all individuals to believe or not believe as their conscience dictates. As we've already heard, the state of religious freedom in North Korea is incredibly perilous, and the crimes being committed against both Christian and shamanic communities are brave. The crimes that are documented in the report, including torture and persecution, may very well, as, as Suyan mentioned, meet the elements of crimes against humanity under the Rome Statute. The, the million dollar question really is what can we do to hold perpetrators to account, uh, to deliver justice to victims and ultimately to prevent further atrocities. Happily, there isn't an absence of accountability options for North Korea. Uh, on the contrary, there are a number of options, some of which will uh, be simpler than others to initiate, but all of which can collectively contribute to the accountability agenda. At the more immediate end of the scale, and perhaps most achievable, are targeted human rights sanctions against identified persons responsible for serious violations against religious adherents and religious communities in North Korea. There is precedent under existing uh, executive orders in the United States, where several North Korean government officials complicit in human rights uh, violations were sanctioned in 2016 and 17. Uh, more recently, the European Union and the United Kingdom both imposed human rights sanctions under, uh, under different regimes against individuals and entities of the North Korean government for their role in serious crimes. These sanctions across the US, UK and EU were not designated for crimes related exclusively to religious freedom violations, but they are indicative of the symbolic and material costs that can be imposed on perpetrators through these existing domestic accountability mechanisms. These targeted sanctions are not going to be the silver bullet in this case, but they are very useful in the uh, domestic accountability toolkit internationally. However, the most recognizable yet, I think also the most distant prospect for accountability uh, remains the International Criminal Court. For many reasons, it's probably worth us thinking past the ICC in the case of North Korea, not least because it's debatable whether it's going to be the best forum um, for North Korea and accountability, but fundamentally because of the likelihood of, of Russian and Chinese vetoes at the Security Council that would block a referral of North Korea. So if we are to assume that the International Criminal Court would not be the most effective path. One international court that could, in theory, exercise jurisdiction over North Korea would be an, uh, an ad hoc international tribunal similar to those of Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Through invoking the responsibility to protect, the majority vote in the General Assembly could, in theory, establish this ad hoc tribunal for North Korea, um, which could be akin to something like Nuremberg, and which wouldn't then need the consent of the Security Council or the North Korean government. Uh, but there are alternatives beyond an international court. The first, and I would actually argue the most important, is the continued documentation of international crimes and the preservation of evidence for future justice and accountability purposes. And here I'm talking about documentation on two levels. On the one hand, we have bodies of the United Nations who can receive and document evidence. Uh, this is primarily led through the OHCHR office in Seoul and its accountability mandate, but also through special procedures. We have a special rapporteur for North Korea. Uh, there's obviously a, a special rapporteur for religious freedom as well, and other bodies such as the working group on arbitrary detention. On the other hand, we have non-governmental organizations such as our own who can compile evidence and dossiers on perpetrators that can be shared with national governments, fact-finding bodies that are established and accountability mechanisms. 
In the Syrian field, we've seen how the Commission for International Justice and Accountability, CJA, which is a private non-governmental team of investigators, has been gathering evidence and creating legal briefs on perpetrators and state organizations in preparation for the day when that evidence can be used to support justice. And there's really no reason why this very same model could not be deployed for North Korea. In fact, I think there's every reason why it should. To state the obvious, there can be no legal accountability without evidence and ultimately documentation of evidence will shape if, when, and how justice can be de uh, delivered for North Korea's religious communities. A good example here is the designation of North Korea as a CPC by USERF in 2021, as Commissioner Davy mentioned earlier, uh, which is based, again, primarily on, on documentation and that evidence uh, that the North Korean government was playing a significant role in particularly severe violations of religious freedom. Finally, in terms of accountability options, there is a role for domestic courts for both criminal and civil cases. In criminal cases, we're seeing European states, such as Germany and Sweden, exercising universal jurisdiction for suspects who stand accused of international crimes committed in other territories. The recent Koblenz trial in Germany, where a former Syrian official was sentenced by a domestic court for international crimes, is perhaps the most recent example of this. In the United States, there is a precedent for civil cases under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which, and to my knowledge, there haven't been many examples of cases, but this is where private citizens may sue a nation state uh, in the case that that state has been designated as a sponsor of terrorism. North Korea is currently on that list as a state sponsor of terrorism, and this isn't, I don't think, ever going to be a wide open path to justice for religious freedom violations, but it remains an option. To wrap up, I believe that collectively the international community has a number of tools, or at the very least we can envision the tools uh, for the community that can hold the North Korean government to account for its crimes against religious communities. The key to this is that we start now. We should be building political will um, across the international community and creating momentum, and all members of the international community should be investing in evidence collection. Only then can we reestablish the unassailable right to freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, James, for that contribution. I'm going to start with a, a, a question um, and then turn over to our commissioners um, for, for their questions. Just a reminder to those in the audience, we will then turn to questions from you all. So if you have a question, please submit it in writing through the, the Q&A function and we will get to those in a, in a few minutes. Um, I'd like to start, I was struck in the report um, by the uh, ramp up in persecution against shamanists and fortune tellers. Um, pre previously, our information had been um, that, that, that they were treated a, a bit more leniently than um, Christians who have long been um, the, the focus of the most severe repression by the North Korean regime. Um, I wondered if you could talk about, and any of you, Su Young, NJ, James, um, unpack a little bit more um, what, um, what you think, if you have a sense of what motivated the directive in, in, in 2018 um, and the increasing um, crackdown on shamanism and fortune telling. Um, let me take the question. Uh, well, with the government having less of a total control over the information environment in over economic activities than they used to in the past, uh, it needs to constantly be on the lookout for uh, what it calls unsocialist and anti-socialist behaviors to stop it becoming normalized or and considered more widely acceptable. And the ruling party receives uh, this reporting on this kind of activities trends at regular intervals from units across the country. And when it seems that something is becoming too widespread, it becomes a focus issue that is met with a central directive. And in the recent directives issued to increase, increase efforts to eradicate shamanism practices, shamanism is blamed for officials ignoring uh, orders or changing the dates for orders according to the advice provided by shamans and shamanic practices are very common among high-ranking high-level officials and as well as among ordinary people and we have also been told of cases where certain shamans received the protection of 
protection of officials, high ranking officials who engage them in this type of uh, type of uh, patronage formation in in the alternative power pockets, however small, is uh, dangerous for the cohesion of the ruling party. I hope that answers the question. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Davey, would, would you like to ask a question? Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and again, thanks to our panelists for their uh, very uh, informative and moving um, uh, presentations on the dire state of the absence of any uh, religious freedom uh, in, uh, in North Korea. My question is for NJ, and NJ, I'm particularly interested in knowing um, sort of whether there are any Christian communities, um, however small, however secretive, that still meet uh, for collective worship services uh, in North Korea, as far as you know. Thank you, Commissioner Davey, for the excellent question. Mm, to answer the questions, I will have to first state that we have previously documented a handful of cases where there has been pockets, small pockets of Christian worshipers and, and a bit of an organized structure within their society. But this really is an, the exception to the rule. It is not an overstatement to claim that any North Korean citizen lives under all North Korean citizens, in fact, lives under a very, a very strict surveillance of the state. Government spies hide among the general populace and frequently report to law enforcement officers. Under such circumstances, it is virtually not possible for any number of individuals to congregate without the fear of being reported to the authorities as political dissidents, and in worst cases, foreign spies. All the Christians that we interviewed for the support told us that they dared not practice their religion together with any other people. The only manifestation of faith involving more than two people was the moment of the proselytization or induction into Christianity where the interviewees learned about Christianity for the first time in their lives. I cannot rule out the possibility that there might be a couple of North Korean Christians who today pray together with their immediate family members, but. I remain skeptical that there is any organized Christian communities surviving in North Korea at the moment. But there has been multiple interviewees who have confirmed that they, in fact, prayed privately and uh, not allowed, and sometimes uh, also in the public by themselves as well. So in the question of whether there are Christians within North Korea, I would answer yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Carr, would you, would you like to ask a question of our panelists? Thank you, Elizabeth, very much. And thanks to Sue Young and uh, uh, NJ and James for the report. <clears throat> um, question I have is, uh, I guess for, for any of you, but uh, NJ's may want to answer it. Uh, the story is about the defectors. I have, we each adopt a prisoner of conscience, and my prisoner of conscience was a, a minister in on the China side of the border with North Korea, and he was kidnapped and taken back to uh, Korea and is in prison. To what extent has the firsthand experience with religious freedom violations contributed to the decision of North Koreans to flee their country? Uh, Commissioner Carr, thank you for an excellent question. I would have to say it really depends on the personal experience of the victim and the religious tradition that they are affiliated with. Whereas a Christian who narrowly escaped being sent to a political prisoner camp or a execution would be entirely compelled to leave North Korea at the first chance that they can. A shaman who has been subjected to forced labor for fortune telling would not consider that defection as the next natural step. That being said, many Christian interviewees after leaving North Korea have readily expressed their joy at being able to practice their faith without uh, fearing persecutions by the state. Moreover, many Christian North Koreans have find the courage to imagine their lives outside of North Korea thanks to their religions. So I would actually confirm that the affiliation with Christianity 
certainly does play a factor in a North Korean individual's decision to defect from North Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, commissioners, if either of you have another question you'd like to ask, or if if not, I will go to, the, we have some questions from the audience as well. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, James a question, if I might, Elizabeth. Absolutely. Uh, particularly about, um, given the high priority, um, obviously the US and the US government and the international community place on security and uh, nuclear non-proliferation concerns. <clears throat> How can um, those negotiations um, take into consideration uh, the promotion and integration of religious freedom uh, and human rights uh, as they engage uh, around uh, these questions of uh, security and uh, and and, non and 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 nuclear non-proliferation? Uh, could, I guess to say it another way, um, should the promotion or can the promotion of uh, an integration of religious freedom and human rights be a part of these policies toward North Korea by the US and the international community? Thanks, Commissioner Davy. Yeah, um, I make on that. I'd make two quick points. Firstly, in the short term, and obviously where where the evidence dictates, yes, I think deploying every available domestic accountability option um, is critical at this stage um, when it comes to the the violations that we've documented today. This doesn't just cover the US, it covers the UK and the EU, both of whom have um, human rights sanctions regimes, as I mentioned in in my presentation. This means that we don't need to reinvent the wheel to do something today. Uh, the US has three executive orders for North Korea and using these mechanisms would um, therefore send an important signal to, to North Korea's perpetrators and challenge the perception of impunity that I'm very sure exists in Pyongyang when it comes to religious freedom crimes. Uh, second, I think it's also going to actually let the, the religious communities inside North Korea and those who, who we have worked with and we, we interview who now live in exile in South Korea and also in, in the UK, um, it will let, let them know that we are actually moving that accountability agenda forward for religious crimes when it comes to North Korea. The second point, and I know that this was a recommendation in USERF's uh, 2021 annual report, is that the US uh, government does fully integrate human rights into every theatre of its foreign policy on North Korea. There's, there has been an assumption, not necessarily in, in the US government, but I think more broadly that bringing up human rights or at the very least having improvements of human rights as uh, preconditions within diplomacy or engagement of North Korea is going to uh, somehow be harmful to the denuclearization or the broader engagement of Pyongyang. Uh, the opposite, I think, is actually true. If we talk about human rights, it gives us leverage. If we don't talk about human rights, which is always going to be North Korea's prof uh, preference, that's going to give uh, Pyongyang leverage. So I'm sure North Korea would like us to think that they're going to be impervious to international pressure on their human rights record, but the reality is um, they're not. There's a reason that they go to incredible lengths to conceal the political prison camps. There's a reason they have built uh, show churches and show temples um, and have actors present uh, pretending congregations for foreign visitors in Pyongyang. Uh, there's a reason they respond so aggressively to human rights council resolutions that condemn their human rights record more broadly. And there's a reason why they push back uh, so hard against targeted human rights sanctions, and I'm sure would do if they were reimposed. Um, the answer to these questions is really that the ruling elite in North Korea does care about the consequences that their human rights record has on their ability to rule, um, primarily because North Korea's leadership group relies on this system that privileges their supporters in Pyongyang through the exploitation of the North Korean population, which includes uh, persecution of religious communities. Um, and I don't think we, also we should forget about the impact that 
us talking today and more broadly, so the US government and the international community about human rights violations, the impact this has then on, on perpetrators. Uh, to give an example, uh, during the, um, the project, we interviewed one perpetrator who had been stationed at a penal facility in North Korea, and they told us how they had received orders uh, not to perpetrate the most serious of violations. And this was said to be a direct consequence of what was being discussed about North Korea's human rights record outside of the country. <clears throat> So there's the issue that not talking about human rights sends the opposite signal to Pyongyang. And um, I think that it's something that, yes, the US government, but more broadly, the international community does need to uh, integrate into every component of engagement and diplomacy with North Korea. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Carr, did you have another question or should I should I go to the audience questions? One, one, uh, one short one, and we've got some great questions coming in from the audience, but just uh, can, can you briefly describe the kind of facilities that uh, uh, the kind of prisons that are holding uh, North Korean uh, religious adherents? And the second question I would have is Open Doors, I believe, says that there are 60 to 70,000 Christians being held in North Korean prisons. Does that number sound correct to you all? Um, thank you for the question, uh, Commissioner Carr. Well, there are uh, two main, there are facilities that are run by BIMI, MSS and MPS, and anyone found to be associated with Christianity is sent to political prison camps that are normally run by MSS in there are cases when during the investigation by MSS some are even first to confess guilt through torture and other cruel and inhumane degrading treatment and that is because MSS officials are incentivized to catch religious adherents to uh, basically get promoted and they when they are sent to political prison camps actually they are tried uh, according to the due process in the internal MSS court, but and also they are sentenced to a certain period, but this is just a formality and it seems people sent there, like sent to a political prison, can barely survive. And for shamanic adhe adherents, they are, uh, they are sent to different types of facilities and usually they are punished in a grad graded way depending on their social influence or the severity of their engagements. And it varies from six months to five years based on the data we've collected. And for shamans sentenced less than one year are sent to labor training centers. And for sentences longer than one year, people are sent to re-education camps and both facilities impose forced labor under harsh environments. And under criminal code, the maximum sentence uh, for superstitious acts is known to be two to th three years. But some people have sentences that exceed that period because they are charged with other crimes alongside the crime of superstitious acts. So there are uh, such facilities. And to answer your second question, um, you mentioned that uh, there are uh, figures uh, based on Open Doors research uh, of 600,000. And well, according- I think, I think the figure was 60 to 70,000. 60 to 70,000, okay, yeah. sir. Uh, it, well, that's actually a question that, uh, that was frequently asked to us as well. But to be honest, we cannot know how many Christians currently exist in North Korea for the simple reason that it is, it is impossible to know. We cannot enter the country to conduct a random non-probability sample that, that would need to be representative of all North Korean citizens. And we cannot access a consensus of the population, but only these two options would allow us to know a true figure. But given all we know about the systematic persecution of Christians, we'll have to, we will only have to assume that number is very low, possibly in the thousand, in, in the thousands. And I know this low number is quite shocking, but yeah, 
we shouldn't we shouldn't forget that just 70 years ago north korea had a religious community of around uh 250,000 christians and now we are just at a fraction of that number Thank you, Sue Young, for that, that helpful answer. Um, I'm now going to go to some of the questions we have from the audience, uh, kind of building on, on Commissioner Carr's um, uh, question and Sue Young, your answer on the two different ministries, the, the Ministry of State Security versus the Ministry of, of People's Security. Um, the question is about the, the North Korean government's rationale for having the two different ministries that, that deal with um, practitioners of Christianity or shamanism. Well, that's uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, well, both both are law enforcement agencies who can arrest and imprison citizens, and MPS can be seen as a national police force with duties of maintaining public order, while the MSS is a domestic intelligence agency uh, with duties of maintaining political conformity. And in practice, uh, shamanism is dealt with by the MPS according to the criminal code, while Christianity is persecuted by the MSS according to political prerogatives. And what is relevant here is that the MSS through the Farm Management Bureau, which is coordinated under the MSS Central Command, oversees a political prison camps that holds Christian adherents and up to three generations of their families. These facilities are perhaps the most uh, recognizable tools used to suppress Christianity. And the MPS also run their own penal facilities where shamanic adherents are sent for punishment, including forced labor camps and re-education camps. And these should not be seen as a lesser form of punishment. They are, they are under brutal environments where inhumane conditions and physical violence and forced labor are common. Thank you. Um, we have another question um, uh, from, from the audience asking, how is the current situation with COVID-19 in North Korea affected religious freedom? I don't know if that's something that you, um, you heard about or, or, or learned about in any, in any of your interviews. This is really a question for any, for any of you. Uh Truly, based on the contents of our interviews, it is, although we were not able to obtain direct testimonials from the religious practitioners or witnesses, it is possible to deduce the impact that COVID-19 has on the lives of the North Korean Christians. Due to the isolated nature of North Korea, most Christian practitioners within the state actually receive their religious uh, literature and the guidance from the people who have connection to Chinese churches, churches that are active in China, and the pastors who are practicing their religion in within Chinese territories. With the closure of the North Korean border to China, North Korea to the North Korean Chinese border that has taken place uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19, the influx of the religious materials and guidance from China had would have likely ceased entirely. That being the case, we can plausibly deduce that the people who are still practicing in North Korea are suffering from the lack of encouragement and also the lack of the no, uh, new guidance and materials from China. Adding on to Angel, um, based on information from our sources, North Korea completely blocked the border with China. So North Koreans living in the border areas who used to live by smuggling goods from China are struggling from hunger due to shortages of food and goods. So basically it is impossible to smuggle anything into North Korea through the Chinese border. And any outside support uh, would happen through secret brokers within North Korea. And this would happen through money that is wired to them, which they would use to buy goods for people within North Korea. And besides the border closure, uh, the government imposed additional measures like lockdown and a curfew. 
Uh, and this would have made any activities associated with religional belief much more difficult. And, and what's interesting uh, is uh, when it comes to COVID-19, on the contrary, on the contrary to the situations in the border sites, uh, according to our sources, Pyongyang is being provided with foods and goods from China via maritime tr trade, avoiding surveillance under uh, the sanctions of the US. And although economic activities have been somewhat, of course, depressed in Pyongyang since last year due to COVID-19, compared to the economic situations uh, in the border cities in the North, they seem to be having relatively decent living conditions. Thank you very much for that. Um, in, in, a, in, a sim, in, in a similar vein, talking, of, talking about the border area, um, an audience member has asked for um, if you could talk more about the role of China in the persecution of North Korea's uh, religious communities, particularly North Korean Christians who were caught in China and sent back into North Korea. Were there, or were there, was there information on, on, on that that came out from your interviews? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I mean, yeah, I mean, China you know, certainly plays an extremely important role in many of the aspects of um, the uh, religious freedom violations that we documented in, in the report. I think the most significant and one which is probably um, sort of most known is that Chinese law enforcement will arrest and then detain and then forcibly repatriate or, as we say, refoul um, all North Koreans in Chinese territory back into, into North Korea. This is, um, in most of these cases, this will be a a, a direct violation um, by China of the, of the 1951 Refugee Convention, of which um, China is a signatory, and uh, which now is considered to be customary international law. Um, on top of the, of the refoulement of North Koreans, we did collect evidence that Chinese officials were marking the refoulement documents of North Koreans in border detention uh, centers on the Chinese side to essentially demarcate if the North Korean was suspected or, or known of, of being a Christian adherent. Um, in these cases, once that North Korean is then uh, repatriated back to North Korean territory, this would enable the, the MSS to uh, perpetrate, um, for example, more egregious um, uh, torture or cruel and human degrading treatment during the interrogation phase of that North Korean. Um, which you know stems from uh, the uh, uh, the Chinese designation of that North Korean as a as a suspected Christian. Uh, we also have evidence that Chinese law enforcement actors were specifically monitoring uh, ethnic Korean churches um, or suspected residences of missionaries in Chinese territory. And I I'm not an expert on Chinese law, and this may not itself be um, be a direct violation of a particular law, but it certainly adds to the targeting and then the subsequent violations faced by North Korean Christians uh, once they are refouled. Um, with, with China as well, there have actually been documented cases um, where North Korean MSS agents um, and their informants who they send into Chinese territory uh, have been working in China seemingly without the express permission of uh, Chinese intelligence or the Chinese state. And in one case, this did lead to the uh, forceful abduction of a North Korean Christian, um, which was conducted by, uh, by MSS, North Korean MSS informant, who had been sent back into uh, China, and also the aid of a, a Chinese criminal organization as well. So um, there are roles of both the Chinese state and Chinese actors within this, and it certainly does play um, a particularly important role. Thank you, James, for, the, for, that, for that answer. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time today um, and we'll have to conclude um, on, on this topic. I want to thank both of our commissioners, Commissioner Davey and Commissioner Carr for, for being with us this morning to lead this conversation. And of course, I want to thank our, our three panelists, um, Sue Young, Injay, and James for their presentations today, their uh, great answers to the questions. And, and also for their, their work on this, on this important report. I also wanna thank Minji Chen, who's USERF's policy analyst covering North Korea, and Danielle Ashbahian, our senior communications specialist for their work on this event and report. 
If you would like to learn more about USERF's work on religious freedom in North Korea, I encourage you to visit our website at www.userf.gov. We look forward to hosting similar conversations to this on other countries and issues in the month ahead. Thank you for tuning in today, and we'll see you next time on USERF Conversations. Have a good day.